Major League pitcher and former Indianapolis Indian Pat Darcy is our guest this week. We'll be back to talk with Pat in just a moment. Major League pitcher and former Indianapolis Indian Pat Darcy is our guest today. Pat, it's been a long time. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. You look good, Howie. <laughs> Last time, I think, 1976, right? <laughs> we have not seen each other since the final day of the 1976 regular season yeah. in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great to connect with you again. And, you know, we'll get to your playing days in a moment, but you've accomplished so much in your post playing days, too. Yeah, I've been pretty active here in Tucson. I grew up here and uh, a lot of organizations, uh, a lot of politics. I'm the, we have the Pima County Sports Hall of Fame, the president of that. And I've been, you know, coaching and you know, giving, giving speeches like you, like you do. Same thing, yeah. And you are involved in commercial real estate. Yes, I'm in commercial real estate, yeah, and a retail division. Uh -huh. And you've done that ever since you got out of baseball, correct? Yeah, I went back to school and uh, got my degree. And I was wondering, I had some friends of mine said, you know, why don't you get into commercial real estate? You know, it's different than residential because you don't work on weekends or evenings, stuff like that. They said, so I went to work. Then I, it was Caldwell Bank or Commercial. And then I went to CV Commercial. Then I'm at Tucson Realty, which is the oldest real estate co company in uh, Southern Arizona. You know, you were originally signed with the Houston Astros, and before you got traded over to the Reds, you pitched in Denver, and maybe it's appropriate, the All-Star game and the home run derby all in Denver. What was, and that was triple-A ball when you pitched in Denver. What was that experience like? It was it was interesting because we used, it was at the Bronco Stadium. Now they got the downtown stadium up for baseball, but uh, it was like, the infield was like a freeway. It was really hard. The balls flew out of there. You know? But I pitched, I had pitched good there. You know, I, I think he'd give them like four home runs, something like that, five home runs there. But, uh, you know, we had, oh, it was Astros triple-A team. We had a pretty decent team. But when I, came, I every year with Houston and Meyer Leagues, every, every team I played on finished last place. Wow. So, well, you had an ERA teams. under four when you pitched in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that is yeah. extremely impressive. Yeah, it was very. It was a tough place. We had we had a charter. We had charter on airlines, so too. That was good too. <laughs> so yeah, that I was know. one of the good. Things. You had a really good sinker ball, and do you think yeah. that's the best pitch to throw at Coors Field? Yeah, definitely, <laughs> you got to keep the ball down the ground. You know, you gotta, you gotta get the ground ball, not the fly balls, because the ball is just you know flying out of that ballpark. Man, it was it was pretty amazing, and the infield was so hard. Which, you know, if you don't hit at somebody, it's probably going to be a base hit. But it was nice. The weather was nice there and all that stuff. But it was a, a big city. And, you, you know, we didn't have to, like, in Indianapolis, we charted, we had to go bring our airlines, you know, stop in Chicago, fly some So this was always direct flights in, in Denver. You and I met in 1974. I still remember your first start. It was the third game of the season in Evansville. And you talk about being, you, you threw nine innings. And I remember, I think it was Junior Kennedy hit a home run in the 10th inning and you were the winning pitcher. And it was a lot different the way pitchers were handled back then than they are now. Yes. I mean, no one put a pitch nine innings their first start that, you know, now. <laughs> you maybe go six innings, seven, they bring another pitcher. In. But yeah, yeah, that was, that's pretty, you know, first start, you go nine innings. That's, that would not happen now. Yeah, that Indianapolis Indians team was just loaded with talent. So many players like yourself, went on to play in the big leagues. Oh, man, we had, I mean, about everybody in the team almost played, you know, our pitching staff, you know, Zachary, Mackinney, Eastwick, the Chicken Man, Andohar, Santo. I mean, that was, in, you know, Doug Flynn, Junior Kennedy, uh, you know, Ray Knight, Dave Reverend, Spencer Griffey, Armbrister. It was, it was, a, it, that had so many future major leagues on that team, I think more than any other team. Here's the way the game has changed with relief pitchers. I remember you mentioned chicken man, Danny Osborne, and I remember him saying to you at an airport several times, Pat, are you starting tonight? And you said, yes. And he said, oh, no, I'm in there again. 
<laughs> which was very <laughs> funny like back then, but there'd be no humor to it now at all. No, he, he always say that. I said, you oh, no, you're starting. I didn't get up sleep last night or something like that. <laughs> that was, it was a crazy team, too. It was, you know, a good lot of personalities in that ball club. Yeah. And I know you would kid around with Doug Flynn a lot. And Doug went on yeah. and played 13 years in the big leagues. Yes, Doug Flynn and, you know, Dave Reverie. You know, and Sonny was a – he didn't play that much in Major League, but it was a coach, you know, Burn brought him up with, as a coach with the Cardinals. But Sonny was a really good catch pitcher for young pitchers. Yes, and that team won the Eastern Division title and then played Tulsa in the league championship series. And to this day in all the years, and this is my 45th season calling Indianapolis Indians games, losing that championship series, being three outs away, being one out away from winning it in six, and losing that game and losing the next night was very disappointing. Yes, it was. You know, it was. And, you know, the, they had a good team, too. You know, they were obviously, you know, the two best teams were playing, but but Tulsa was good, very good. It was, it was Dave, Ken Boyer was coaching that team. Yes, Tulsa was good, but they weren't quite as good. They had lost Keith Hernandez and Mark Hill to the big leagues. We lost players too, obviously, but I thought that we were stronger uh, than they were, and Santo Alcala had that three-run lead going to the ninth, and they tied the game, won it in 15, and won the next night behind Mike Topper Thompson. Yes, yes. And I remember there, now you bring that up. Somebody hit a ground, their shortstop was behind someone or something like that. And it, somebody hit a ground ball, took a bat on the car with his throwing hand. Remember that? And threw the guy out. That was a key play. And that, that, that would have won the game. That ball would have got through. That was an amazing play by that guy. Yeah, it was tough. The next year, you go to Cincinnati and you win yeah. 11 games. You had a terrific major. Your first season in the big leagues, you were terrific. Yeah, that was like, you know, there was one spot open in spring training and I got the spot and I started out pitching kind of like a little bit in relief. And then I, you know, pitched, then I might start and I said, it was really hard. Now you understand how guys, you know, you play in the minor leagues and you're in, you play like you're a starter, you play every game or pitch you once every five days, all of a sudden you're in the major leagues and you're not doing that. You're pitching once every 10 days. You, you can't go down and warm up because you might be pitching that night. So you can't. So it was really hard. But then when Don Gullett broke, got hit with, hit with a line drive, broke his wrist. He went out, they put me in, and they left me in there. And that, that was the start of the rest of the season. Yeah, <laughs> you were, <coughs> excuse me, you were there all season. The following year, you were there the first couple of months of the year. What were your thoughts on, <coughs> excuse me, Pat, what were your thoughts on those Reds team? Because most people feel they were among greatest teams of all time. You know, it, it was a really good team and really good team chemistry. I mean, we had, and the clubhouse, I mean, way, it was sparky the way you handle the clubhouse. You know, no one was really treated that much differently than anybody else. If you would have walked in there, if there was a camera, you had a camera looking down at our clubhouse, you could not tell who would be the best player. All the lockers were the same. Everybody was, you know, a lot of kidding around, but it was just, there were no special people in there. Everybody was kind of treated the same. That's, that's the way Sparky wanted it. And if somebody got a hand a little bit, you had team leaders like Bench Rose, Morgan Press, come over and say, hey, you know, you haven't been up that long. What are you talking like this? What are you acting like this? So Sparky didn't have to do that. The players kind of policed themselves. You know, when I think back to the, those teams and then they didn't win in 77 and 78 despite acquiring Tom Seaver, I think the trade of Tony Perez is on, and other people have told me that too. Russ Nixon was one of them. Trading Tony Perez turned out to be a big mistake because of the influence he had in that clubhouse. Yes, and Bob Housen kind of mentioned that too. And it's interesting that uh, when I was, I kept up with Bob Housen over the years and we lost the Cleveland Indians here in spring training in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And there was a committee formed to find a replacement team formed. I was on the committee and I called Bob Powell's up. And he was living in Denver then. And she had two at home in Denver and in Cincinnati. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll watch things for you in Denver because they might get a team here. And then he had someone call me from Denver to come out. I'm flying out. I'm, Could you show me the stadium for the Indians, like the facilities? And I did that, and I became the point person for the Rockies and other teams coming here too. So they would call me, and that's how I kind of got involved and meet a lot of different people and being being the guy, 
you know, we were talking to the people from Seattle, San Diego, and then, you know, the, what, we had all these White Sox, d back were coming in, but the Rockies were the first team. They came in, but Precy Indians, and that kind of turned things around here with the Tucson, too. That's terrific. We'll have more with Pat Darcy after these messages. Unfortunate, Pat, that your pitching career, as your career came to an end, and you were still fairly young. Yeah, it was. I, I had arm problems really throughout my career, and uh, back then, sports medicine wasn't what it is today. And uh, was, I, you know, tried coming back. I had shoulder problems. I had two shoulder surgeries. But uh, you know, just things have changed so much better now for sports medicine. People, you know, players getting hurt. Yes. Let's go back to the '75 team. Uh, they were in the postseason in 70 in the World Series, in 72, in 73 in the League Championship Series. And there was a kind of feeling like they've got to win it all sooner or later. And in fact, had the Reds not won that seventh game in Boston, they might have fired Sparky Anderson at that time. That was, you know, they had, uh, like Ben said, we were, we lost that. We were the Buffalo Bills. So. You know, we just, but they had, you know, they had good teams. It's just one of those things, you know, that you know, they got beat Oakland. Oakland was really good for a while. And then the Dodgers are really, Dodgers are really good, you know, just like us, really, really good pitching and good players too. You're ahead three games to two. And then you had a lot of rain in Boston. And I remember you telling me I ate a lot of seafood. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> it did, That's how that was handled back then. We had three days we, we were we had three games to two. We came back and we came back on we came back to Boston on Friday. It was nice out, so it rained on Saturday, and we didn't do anything. We just you know there's no game. We didn't go to the clubhouse, nothing. And then then Sunday we went out to Tufts University, and the driver got lost going out there. And so we had a pull uh -huh. to a, a gas station like at noon, and Sparky's got his uniform on, and he walks up. Everything was like, everything just froze. Like, what's Sparky? So we go to Tufts University, their field house, and there's no security. And so we're in the batting, we're in this, you know, indoor area where they have, you know, play and all that. And, and the students start coming in. So you got students standing next to you. <laughs> it's just, it was just weird. There was just no security at all. And so we played there, you know, took batting practice in the field house, stuff like that. And then Monday it rained and we didn't do anything either. You know, it was just like, now they'd be working out, you know, everything would be secure. And it, it was just total different times back then. Then we then we played on Tuesday, yeah. But and the Reds had, had a lead late in the game. And Raleigh Eastwick, I think, was going to be the MVP of the series. <laughs> and he had pitched so great. And then he had Bernie Carbo. He almost struck him out. And then Bernie Carbo hit a game tying. I think it was a three-run homer, but it was a game tying home run <laughs> around the eighth inning. Yeah, that I was in the, you know, if you weren't starting in the World Series, you know, next day you were in the bullpen. And I remember sitting on the bullpen, we're at six to three, and Bernie's up the plate, fell and pitches off. And I'm saying, God, my first full season in the major leagues, and we're going to win the World Series. Next ball gets, gets out of the ballpark in center field. And I'm going from that to, I could be in this game, you know? So, so <laughs> I start warming up, and then I came in the 10th inning, and I remember that uh, Evans was the first guy I faced. And he hard get ground ball, I knocked it down. And by the, by the time I got the ball, he was by me. I was down by the first baseline. And all I could see was Tony's glove sticking out. And I threw it, hit him right, Tony right in the glove. I don't know how I did it. And so I, after the play, they threw the ball around the infield. And Morgan, I made a pitch, and Morgan runs up, up to me, kind of runs by me. He said, you just made a great play in the World Series. He went back to his position. But we were on one of those shows, on, on Bob Costa's shows year, quite a while ago. And we're talk, talking about it. It's the first time I'd ever seen it. I'd never seen it in, in, on TV. I just like the play in person, I knew. And I thought Joe, Joe came in. Then he, 
late, you know, we're ready to pitch you. And then you see him come running in, ran right by me with acquisition <laughs> to say oh, that. But that was uh, really neat. Yeah. And the first two innings after, I believe, you retired the side in order. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then Fisk came up. It was 0-2-0 and 2, 2 and 0 on him. And I threw a pitch, and he hit a high pop fly. And it just hung up in the air. The wind was blowing from, like, left to right. And everybody's watching it. And it hit the foul pole and bounced it. And I didn't realize that Foster caught the ball after the foul pole. And he sold it, like, 20 years later. I said, <laughs> George. How did you convince the guy that was a ball? I said, I got a bunch of them. <laughs> 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 but that you know, that was amazing that that ball just hung up there in the air. And then I didn't realize it hit the foul pole that bounced back to Foster. And then we came back and, uh, you know, won game seven. See, the that's fight. one thing. Now, it was one of the great moments in baseball history, just getting that home run. But, mm -hmm. and you mentioned this to me years ago when we spoke, you said, you know, I say, how do you feel? Well, it was game six, not game seven. And the Reds yeah. came back and won game seven. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. So that makes a big difference in how you felt about everything afterward, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, you know, it was my, but again, I, you know, I, my third inning, it was weird because as a starting pitcher, you can kind of pace yourself. You go in as a closer like that, you're not, you're going all out every pitch. You're not trying to pace yourself and you're just going hard. And it kind of takes something out of you if you're not used to you know doing like that in the you know, like in the third inning because you didn't you know you know you're starting you pace yourself no big dig give a hit or can run you're okay this one is you have a run the game's over right and then you told me uh, years ago you met Carlton Fisk at a card show yeah and I thought the line he said to you was so terrific and so appropriate and when he said to you. Well, in the end, that home run was not about me. It was not about you. It was about what it did for baseball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of turned things that kind of that turned things around really for baseball because it was kind of struggling some. Yeah. Well, attendance had dipped, and you know, pro football was coming into its own on television and the yeah. NBA too. And then baseball came back, and you see what happened afterward. The way attendance uh, was on the rise for that point. What was it like the following spring in spring training, you know, after having won the world championship? It was, you know, we had won the championship and it was, uh, it was, we finally did it, you know? And so we had a really good team and, um, you know, every, the team chemistry was great. And, the, you know, when they take, got Tony, traded Tony away, that kind of hurt something, it hurt a lot. But still it was, you know, we came in, we we're world champions. We, they won again in 76. Yeah, and you won the thing in 75, that division by, it might have been 20 games or close to that. You were that dominant of all. Yeah, and the Dodgers were good. The Dodgers had a good team back then, too. Yeah. And Pittsburgh was good. And the conditions, Pat, in the minor leagues are so much better than they were. And I'm sure they're better in the big leagues, too, than they were back then. Yeah, they were, you know, not good. And, uh, you know, Bush Stadium was nice. It had that, like, a Western Union keep the for the other scores other games uh it was but man it was you know, you know they had that daylight savings time so when you're pitching and, and home plate wasn't that far from the stands back behind the catcher and so you'd be pitching there and everybody had these white shirts on and you don't know it's a line drive back because you can't see that much so it gets darker but right. you know it was just but it was a neat field it, it was a neat field now you know it was, but now that all these all these stadiums we played most of them are gone now Right. You know, they have downtown stadiums. Yeah. Well, Vern Rapp wanted, he was the Indians manager and he was pitching oriented. and he wanted that infield grass high and the pitchers <laughs> like that. The hitters didn't like it though. Oh, no, that's what Vern said. If you get a pitcher gives up a ground ball, he deserves to make it out, get it out. And that, that grass was long. <laughs> yeah. Was I think there was more like of that tailoring things than there is in this day and age too. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, they get, you know, sometimes they have the grass a little higher for a few, you know, a lot of ground balls, stuff like that. So, yeah, they've changed. One of the guys who was your teammate with the Reds and came to Indianapolis to rehab that had me laughing all the time was Gary Nolan and his Wolfman Jack imitations. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was my, in, in 74, when I got traded over, he was my roommate in spring training in 74 Tampa. And he, 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 he missed half of two seasons. 
for his shoulder problems. And back then, sports medicine wasn't that great. So that year, he dressed it up. So I remember in spring training 74, his arm was still bothering him. So they, one of the big things back then was if, you're hurt, if your arm's hurting, if you throw through the pain, you'll break these adhesions and everything's fine, you know? So they shot him up with Novocaine. <laughs> he went out and threw, and everybody was saying, everybody was, yeah, he threw good. He's really good, you know? So the next morning, he couldn't get his shirt on. His arm hurt so bad. I didn't want to put his shirt on. So they waited a couple of days. They shot him up again, and he told me, he think he threw a ball maybe 30 feet, something like that. So, so he's, they're going to send him out to see Joe, these two new doctors in L.A., Job and Curlin, who became really superstar doctors for sports. And so we're going out to dinner that night, and he's thinking, oh, man. He says, you know, what if, what if they can't find anything, and it's in my head, or what if, what if it's really bad? And I said, Jerry, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> when you wake up from surgery, the doctor said, Gary, we got some good news and some bad news. First, the good news, you'll never have a sore arm again. Now the bad news, we had to cut your arm off. <laughs> <laughs> he still brings that up today. Funny. You guys were funny and guys were so funny back then. Pat, it's, yeah, wonderful he still spending, today. it's wonderful spending <laughs> time with you. Thank you so much. Okay, man, we're good seeing you. It's been a while. Yeah, like Take care. 45 years. That's Pat Darcy. We'll have more in just a moment. Darcy, former Major League pitcher. We'll talk to another former Major League pitcher next week in Tom Walker. We'll see you.